fantastic, great news. Okay, so let's make a start. Um, I'll put this onto presentation mode. So welcome everybody and a huge welcome to our colleagues from Asia. This is the second Shasan Sustainable Hydropower um, webinar. And this is focusing, of course, on Asia in this, in this case. So a big warm welcome to everybody from Asia and beyond. So what is Shasan? What I'm gonna do is really give a very quick um, overview of what the Shazan network is all about for people's interests. And then I'll invite any questions or comments after that. And then I will introduce our guest speakers today and um, act as the chair for this session. So let's start off by defining the problem and trying to solve. We are looking at large river systems in tropical, subtropical, neotropical, and southern temperate regions. And these are areas where we have very high productivity, and very high species richness and endemism. At the same time, these rivers are being hugely developed and hugely engineered. So in these regions of the world, freshwater ecosystems are the most threatened of all. What is also really important to recognize is the importance of these rivers and these and the fisheries they sustain in terms of um, providing protein for low income for fishing communities and being a real economic driver in these parts of the world. Huge numbers of people are dependent on the rivers and the fisheries they support. And this is particularly the case on the Mekong River, which is a system that we're going to hear more about in today's webinar. The other thing is that these rivers are going through massive development of hydro, the largest dams in the world, some of the most significant hydropower development is taking place in these regions of South America, Africa and Asia. So what we have when we superimpose this activity on top of the huge amount of species richness and productivity and endemism are biodiversity hotspots. So what we are aiming to do with the Shasan network is to bring together a group of experts and people that are interested in this from a range of backgrounds, whether it's biologists and engineers, whether it's people from industry or people that are interested in the social science components. And the idea we're intending to improve sustainability of hydropower. We want to protect fisheries on which the low income fishing communities in the developing nations depend for food security. And we want to advance environmental impact mitigation technology and develop more sustainable operations and planning practices. And this is really taking an, an approach from the cradle through to the grave. So developing more sustainability in the planning phases, the construction phases. Once the dams are built, how we operate them and the strategies we employ, going right through to decommissioning at the end of life and the removal of dams to restore um, connectivity. And then what we're interested in doing as part of the network is disseminating knowledge and building a cohort and a group of people across um, the regions that we're interested in, South America, Africa and Asia, and building a, de a dependent and reliable um, network between the global north to transfer information to the south and vice versa, and between southern hemisphere countries and uh, developing nations associated. So the plan for Shisan is that year one, which is 2021, we're basically developing the network, we're building the participant list, we, we're really trying to spread the word of what we're trying to do. So we've had our first webinar in South America, um, which was very well um, attended. Today represents the second seminar, which is the Asian seminar, um, which is going to be hosted by the Institute of Hydroecology and the University of Southampton. And then later on this year, we will have the final of the three webinars, which will be 
focusing on Africa and hosted by African partners. We're going to then in 2022, the, the um, second year of the network is hold physical events in South America and Asia with our fingers properly crossed for hopefully COVID-19 will enable us to have these events uh, go ahead. Our first event will be in South America in July, and then later on in the year, we will have the second physical workshop in Asia. In 2023, we hope that the network will then be self-sustaining and we will have a third event hosted by colleagues in Africa. And from that, we will build and hopefully Shasan will have a long uh, historic, uh, a long legacy for the future. Uh, I mean, ah, fala assim que o Ibama, a sua amiga Tommy, não tem, não tem. In terms of developing policy briefs and um, future scientific programs and collaborations between the participants. So just to remind you, Shasan webinar number one was focusing on um, South America. It was, it was in July, on July the 14th this year, and it was hosted by the University of Conception and the University of Southampton. Um, and we had a total of 91 attendees at that event representing 21 countries. This is our management team. What I want to emphasize here is the high diversity and the expertise available within that network of people representing um, South America, Asia, and Africa. Just want to say a special thank to the Global Challenges Research Fund for giving us the funding available for the first two years, for this year and also to host physical events um, in 2022. Now today, webinar number two, as I've said, we're focusing on the Asian context. We have four guest speakers, Professor Jan Bo Chang from uh, the Institute of Hydroecology in, in China, in Wuhan. We have um, the professor for today, Peng Bun Jo um, from Cambodia, who's gonna be talking about assemblages, responses to flow changes in terms of fish. We have Guangzhou Jin from China, who's gonna be looking at the ecological effects of lakes and wetlands under hydrological processes. And we have An Vi Vu from Vietnam, who's going to be really focusing on diversity and fish migration on the River Mekong. So that is the plan for today. Um, I'd just like to ask now if there's any key questions or comments and invite any um, conversation for the next few minutes about the network and what we aim to achieve. I can't see if there's anyone's hands up. So if there is um, any questions, please shout out. Okay, Judy, can you see if I'm still sharing the screen? Yeah. Okay, so hopefully Thank I'll you. stop sharing now. Okay, so anyone with any questions or comments, please shout out, otherwise we will um, ask for them at the end of the session. So now if um, we could have our next speaker, which is Dr. Peng Bon Jo um, from Cambodia. He has been actively involved on research um, in Cambodia and um, the Mekong River in particular for the past um, near, um, two decades, both as on the Mekong River Commission and the Cambodian In Inland Fisheries Research and Development Institute. And he's soon to be the Dean of the Fisheries Faculty at the Royal University of Agriculture. So welcome Pengbong and um, I'm really looking forward to your presentation on fish assemblage response to flow in the, in the lower Mekong Basin. Evening from Phnom Penh. I hope you can hear me well because now it's raining really hard outside. 
So can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, so I will uh, present to you today about fish assembly responses to flow change in the lava Mekong river system. To begin with, I would like to uh, show you briefly about the Mekong uh, fishes. This graph showing you the, uh, the size of the fish in the Mekong. So some species uh, might sexually mature at about 1.5 centimeter to uh, medium sized species or uh, 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 one meter long or to the world largest freshwater fish. For example, the Mekong uh, giant catfish and chan bab. So in terms of fish pass, maybe it's quite a challenging issue to design a fish pass that can allow all these species to pass through, uh, I guess, for the dam. Then I will uh, briefly give you briefly about the uh, broad scale migration patterns of the fish in the lava Mekong system. So generally there is three patterns. The first one in the upper lava Mekong basin in Thailand and Laos. And the uh, pink arrow indicate the wet, wet season migration and the green for the dry season migration. And the middle pattern is mainly in Laos and also probably in Thailand. And uh, the other uh, migration pattern is mainly occur in Cambodia and, uh, and the Mekong Delta of Vietnam. And this graph specifically show you the, uh, this area in Cambodia and Vietnam, partly in Laos, which is called the uh, the Se Kong River, the Se San River, the uh, Srepok River, one of uh, the major type 2 tree of the Mekong system. And the, these three river contribute about 20-25% 20, 20, of the annual Mekong flow. And for fish migrations, uh, in around June, June, July, fish migrate from the mainstream of the Mekong to the type 2 trees of the 3S. And they return in October or November back to the mainstream for for sedentary period or for spawning and start the next cycle of migration. And here in the Tonle Sap River in Cambodia, the fishery usually peak uh, during the receding flow during the dry season especially between November and, and March. And the peak of the fisheries occur mainly uh, during a time window of about one week before the full moon. And where many uh, river range species have to migrate back from the, the Lake Up Lake and Platte Plain back to the Mekong mainstream. And what dry migrations? So mainly hydrology, precipitations, and uh, other factors. You can see a figure here on the right. The upper panel indicate flat plain, and the lower panel is river. And you can see high hydrograph in this region. The uh, flow start to increase in around uh, June, July, and then peak in uh, early October and then the low flow in April. And when the water levels start to increase, fish to start to migrate to flat plain, to rear and feed. And then during the peak flow, they really feed and grow. And then during the low flow, they migrate back from the flat plain to the river. And most of the river range species here we call white fish, migrate and spawn within the main river channel, especially the Mekong River. 
So this study investigate, this case study investigate the changes in flow, seasonality and predictability in three rivers of the Lava Mekong system. The first one is the Le Sap River, located in Cambodia. I think all, all three rivers are located in Cambodia. And the second one is in uh, KT, which is the Mekong mainstream. And the third one is in uh, Sesan uh, River, or in short, SS River. And among the three rivers, SS are highly regulated by them. There are many, many of them uh, are in operation upstream of the river. So then I will ex examine the seasonal response of fish to be assembled to different flow seasonality and predictability, and also the interannual responses of fish abundance and the uh, specific composition or beta diversity index to this flow change. What do we mean by seasonality and predictability? And based on Coel, seasonality is the consistency of timing between years, quantify the degree of repeatability of biological and physical periodic phenomena. Whereas predictability is the regularity of recurrence of the within cycle, for example, annual cycle, distribution of events across multiple cycles. So for this study, to learn about the change in flow seasonality and predictability, we use water level data for the first period in nine, between 1965 to 1969. This is as a baseline period uh, or pre dam period. And then the other period is between 2007 to 2014. This is after dam period post-dam period. And then we uh, use the uh, time series fish data, weekly fish data between 2007 and 14 to see how fish respond to flow change. So in conducting the analysis, we compute flow or coval index for the flow seasonality, which means to quantify the uh, strengths of the seasonality of the uh, three study rivers. And for flow predictability, we use wavelet to characterize the seasonal pattern of hydrology and dominant temporal cycles. Average wavelet power is used to compare the predictability among the three uh, rivers we study. And for fish response to flow, first, Look at the seasonal pattern by implementing or, or using the uh, principal component analysis, analysis, group the fish assemblage by wet and dry seasons. And also, we look at the, uh, we compute the beta diversity, seasonal beta diversity, and part, partition it into turnover and nestedness. Species turnover mean species replacement in one season by different species in the other season, whereas species uh, nestedness is the species in one season is being a strict subset of the other season. For the interannual response of fish to flow, we employ cross wavelet on the uh, species abundant versus water level, and we also compute the uh, Beta diversity, the local contribution to beta diversity or LCBD, and plot those again flow to see the significant change uh, in specific composition in relation to flow. So, uh, as you can see, uh, Coval seasonality index from Sea River. The index, uh, the value of the index, uh, range between zero and one. One indicate the strongest seasonality. We are zero, we are the weakest seasonality. So, this is for pre dam, 1965 to 1969. We can see that 
uh, of the Sri River, the index indicate strong seasonality of flow for the Sri River in SS, KT, and TS. And for the predictability, we are represented by the uh, wavelet power here. Uh, graph on the left, the box, the, the, the line plot, uh, indicate the observed series of water level, whereas on the right, indicate the uh, wavelet power spectrum. And in the uh, Uh, for, for the wavelet, the uh, time series of the water here is decomposed into time, the frequencies, and the power, which can be examined in three dimensional space through the plot of the wavelet power spectrum. So, in this plot, time indicates the theory on the X axis here from 1966 to 1969, while the contribution of the frequency is represented by period here in, uh, in week on the y, y axis, whereas the power characterizes the magnitude of variance within the time series. So the wavelet power spectrum determines which features of the signal are determinant and contributive and which are less significant. So all the three wavelet power here are captured in figure C here. You can see before them, uh, the predictability level of the three river are relatively strong and the strong predictability of, of flow was found for TS, followed by KT and SS. And this is after a post time period. The coal index also still, seasonality index still relatively high. The highest was in TS and followed by KT and SS. However, for the uh, predictability of flow, you can see from the valid power, which capture in figure C, uh, the predictability level of TS in TS and KT is still relatively strong as compared to the pre dam where, however, in, uh, during the post dam period, the predictability of flow in SS uh, become much weaker. And you can see one uh, line graph here on the top right corner. In SS, actually, there are many dams has been constructed since 1990s. And the line graph represents the cumulative storage capacity of the dam reservoir. So back to the previous slide, we can summarize each slide as follows. You see here the table showing the seasonal coal seasonality index, which uh, Overall, there is increase in, seasonal, in seasonality index, but uh, the level of, of decrease is uh, very not significant. However, if you see the predictability is quantified through the use of wavelet, you can see uh, there's a significant decrease in level of uh, predictability, especially in SS, where the, the river flow are highly regulated by them. Whereas in other two rivers, the Mekong in KT and the Tolesa, the, the, Tolesa, the TS, uh, are still, uh, we are still free flowing, free flowing river. The level of predictability of flow is still relatively strong uh, before and after them. So now we see how seasonal assembly of fish respond to flow change. So uh, you can see here clear differences in fish assembly between uh, dry and wet season were observed in SS. 
and to a lesser extent in KT and while seesaw assembly in TS appeared less discriminated between the two seasons. Some broad pattern diversity show a gradient of seasonal species turnover among size, among the uh, study river with the highest value observed in SS and the lowest were observed in TS while KT display intermediate value for both species turnover and nestedness. So here is the cross wavelet between uh, two time series of fish and the water level. Uh, graph on the left represent the observed series, red represent the uh, fish, whereas the blue represent water level from the three river and on the right side is the uh, showing the relationship between the two series as you can see in in ss there is no relationship between uh, the fish and the flows and the signal that represented by the red band here are quite chaotic in SS, whereas in KT and uh, TS, there are strong relationships represented by the red band signal here, especially at the annual cycle, maybe about at, at peak 52, and also to a lesser extent at the semi annual cycle at peak about 26 for both KT and TS. And the wavelet, cross wavelet power here are captured in this uh, one graph. We show the relationship between fish abundance and the flows, predictability especially. As you can see, there are still strong uh, relationship between fish and the flow in uh, KT and TS. However, we have a very weak relationship in SS, where the flow are highly regulated by them. Interannual inter assembly compositions of the beta diversity respond to flow. You can see in SS, here, the, the blue represent water a series, whereas the red represent beta diversity, which indicate the index for specific composition. And the dot here, the red dot, indicate uh, the significant uh, difference between uh, sampling units, which indicate the uni uniqueness of uh, specific composition along this series. So you, you can see from this significant level, from these significant differences or the uniqueness of specific composition in SS uh, up here to occur random in relation to flow cycle. It's up here randomly. However, oops, sorry. In KT and TS, for example, in KT, the significant uh, really occur in relation uh, to seasonal flow. For example, in KT, the significant uh, uh, specific composition were found when the water level start uh, increasing. And this repeat for every cycle of, of, of flow. And the same for TS, the significance of specific composition were found to occur in the receding flow. And this repeat uh, for all, almost all cycle during the study period. So in summary, time series data, for example, uh, abundance flow is really essential to learn about uh, fish migration and how they respond to flow. We find significant decrease in the predictability level of flow observed in the SS where them where where the river flow are highly highly regulated by them. And in river with strong seasonality and predictability in for example KT and TS, fish assembly shows strong seasonal variations and regular peak migrations. 
and significant petadiversity also occur regularly in relation to hydrological cycles. In viewer with less seasonality and predictability, fish assembly just show little seasonal variation and unreliable peak migrations. Significant petadiversity diversity also show no pattern in relation to hydrological cycle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pengbun. So do we have questions, comments? Pengbun, if you could stop sharing, that's great, so we can see you. Um, Hector has his hand up. Hector, yes, please. We stop now. Hello. Thank Hello. you for your presentation. Wow. Hector, I think you have frozen. So, so while we try and get you back, I'll see if we have any other questions uh, or comments. Do we have another question, please? Yes, Paul, it's Tuan Tong. Can, can I start my question to Pembun? Yes, please do, please do. Uh, okay, Pen Pembun, thank you very much for the comprehensive presentations. I'm very interested in your Covell index results uh, between the two periods uh, that we see that there is less difference in terms of the Covell index. So could we interpret that result that uh, there is less impact from the Chinese dam to the lower Mekong Basin since the time period is about uh, 1960, right? And about at the 2014, that before the Sayaburi Dam. So, so can we interpret the result like that? Thank you, Professor Tuan Tong. Uh, the, the data series we use, uh, for example, uh, in the context of the Lava Mekong for the mainstream, it's before 15, so it's still uh, free flowing before Sayabori and Don Sahong. Mm -hmm. However, for, for the Sesan, uh, I, I think uh, them has been just in the 1990s, uh, so we find, uh, as indicated in the presentation for the Cowell uh, Seasonality Index, there is no not much. Uh, not much change because we still have clear wet and dry season. But the uh, thing that we observe strongly is the predictability, the re regularity of flows. And you know, uh, many liter literature indicate that flow are really essential. It's uh, an environmental trigger to trigger fish to migrate, either migrate for spawning, for feeding, or rearing. I'm not sure I answer your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. Just, I, I, I just uh, try to understand more about the COVID index, but very interesting. Thank you. But for the uh, related to Chinese dam, actually, we look at overall flow, so mm -hmm. it's a uh, little mm -hmm. difficult to refer to specific dam unless uh, we have data really just below that dam. And yeah. fish yeah. flow and fish data just below that dam, then maybe mm -hmm. we can be before and after okay. dam. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for that question and that interesting response. Can we have some more questions and comments, please? Luz. Thank you. I, I've had a nice, nice presentation. Thank you for the results you show. Um, there is an interesting results about uh, the association between the response of fish assemblages and the, and the hydrological dynamics of the river. Do you have any evidence about the change in beta diversity between the ecosystems in the basin? For example, uh, lakes in the floodplain and the riverbed or streams? I... Uh... So uh, I just repeat your question, change in diversity, right? In different- Yes, change in the, in the, in the beta diversity. 
between yeah, the uh, you have the, the, you found the relationship between the the uh, uh, hydrodynamics and the assembly fish assemblage. And my question is, if you have found another relationship or another differences between the alpha beta diversity between ecosystems in the in the same moment. Maybe I, I, I will try to uh, uh, answer from what I presented. Uh, I think in the uh, one graph that I showed the principal component analysis between wet and dry season, you can see, for example, in river uh, with uh, flow modifications. So uh, there is a difference of assembly composition between wet and dry season. And there is a gradient, uh, for example, in uh, TS, where the, the river is still free flowing, uh, we find the uh, uh, a strong, we, we, we find the uh, low species turnover. So the species composition in the wet and the dry season are very, uh, to, to certain extent, they are overlapping which indicate, uh, especially for the river rhine fish, they migrate during the uh, increasing flow to utilize uh, flat plains in the Tonle Sap, in the TS, to feed and grow. And then when the flow recedes, these fish, these river rhine fish return to the main river channel. In terms of, uh, I think in terms of diversity, probably in the context of the lava Mekong basin, I would say uh, uh, between river and lake, you will find different. Uh, you might find different species. For example, river usually you will find uh, a river line, longitudinal migratory species. We ask in lake, here in the lake or in flat plains, you will find more sedentary or here we call, we refer to blackfish, fish that uh, do not perform the littoral or longitudinal migration. They mainly stay in the lakes permanently. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the question, Luz. And, and thank you for that answer, Peng Bun. We have managed to get a question from Hector in the chat and he's asking, what is the response of the large fishes to this um, the, the pattern of flow and are variations related to climate change or overfishing? Yeah, uh, I think that's a very interesting question and a little bit outside of the presentation, but I, I can help answer from my recent publications especially for the Northern Lakes, the Lake up Lake Fishery, the largest lake in Southeast Asia. Uh, and also uh, I've been doing some analysis for, for uh, future publication. We found flow, flow is really important, especially for the, uh, the dispersal ability of large fish from the upstream to downstream to the lava flat plains. So we, strive, we find kind of a positive so they can correlation between flows and the abundance of large size species in the downstream, downstream park plane. So from this, we, we, uh, we might uh, learn that if there is a proposed dam across the river, so probably uh, large fish, uh, and mo most of them are specialist species, maybe are highly impacted by all these uh, all these uh, water development projects. And uh, ac actually from my presentation, I look at the whole assemblage, not really touch on, uh, on life size species. With regard to overfishing, uh, now we find uh, uh, most of the catch from the lake, which uh, Every season we caught uh, more than 100 species, like 100, uh, 250 species every fishing seasons. And over the last 20 years, we, we find there is a strong decline in the large size species 
uh, there is strong decline in catch of large size species. And those decline are really related to uh, higher species with higher trophic levels. And the proportion of the small size, uh, small size species are still uh, are quite abundant and some species even increased over the last 20 years. Thank you, Peng Bung. That's, um, it sounds like a common pattern that I've seen in various places. So I just got one final question and that is um, obviously other factors change such as temperature and uh, saline intrusion, so salinity. Has, has there been research looking at the influence of temperature regime and salinity as well as flow? I, I think in terms of salinity, maybe uh, good for Anne because Anne uh, live in the Delta. So <laughs> here in, in uh, Cambodia, up, up the Mekong, uh, maybe it's not affected by uh, the salinity or the uh, intrusion of sea water. But in terms of climate change, over the last five, six years in uh, 2015, we found uh, we suffer from drought. And in addition to drought, uh, there are two more dams on the mainstream in, uh, in Upper Mekong in Laos. Uh, now uh, both them are in, in operation. Also in the eastern, in, in the 3S, in the, in, in the 3S, uh, in this presentation, uh, also there's one dam in Cambodia that block about 20% of flow. So what impact uh, I can see from my experience here, there is, uh, there is no strong uh, pal that we used to have, especially for the Lava Flat Plain Lighten Lizard. So up to now, we expect, uh, we expect a lot of floods to invade the flat plain for species to, to feed and grow and reproduce. But now the, the, the piles that push uh, the flow from the Mekong to the lakes very weak. Right. Thank you very much for your answers, Pengbun. Um, there are more questions. I can see there's a question from Toloy in the chat. Could I request that you answer those questions and co co continue the discussion in the chat as we move on to our, our next speaker? So thank you very much. That's an excellent presentation and some, and some really great questions as well. Mm -hmm. So our next presenter is Anh Vi Vu from Vietnam. Anvi is um, the Vice Head of the Fisheries and Aquatic Resource Division at the Research Institute for Aquaculture in Vietnam and he's going to talk about diversity in migration patterns of Mekong fish. Thanks a lot, Anne. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, I work as a fishery researcher in Vietnam and currently I'm doing a PhD in Australia. So now I'm going to talk about diversity in migration pattern in Mekong fish. So first of all, I'm going to show you an overview of the Mekong fisheries, then talk about the diversity of Mekong fish migration. It is a part of my PhD study. Uh, finally, you're going to watch a short video about hydropower dam located in the main stream of the Mekong River. Uh, this is the Mekong River, uh, started in China and then running through six countries downstream to the sea. Uh, in terms of number of species, Mekong River is ranked at the third largest number of species in the world after Amazon and Congo River. Here you hear about some key figures of the Mekong River, the Mekong fisheries. Um, Mekong River is home to about 1,200 species, and most of them are small size, as you see in the pictures. They produce about 4.4 million tons of fish every year, and half of them come from capture fisheries. Uh, about two-thirds of population participate in fishing, but mainly about part-time fishing. And it, a person consume about 63 kg per year. About the Mekong fish, about 10% of uh, Mekong fish species are under in danger, especially uh, 17 species are critically in danger. 
So here are some typical species that are under critical in danger. Um, the Mekong giant catfish, the Mekong giant bark are iconic species of the Mekong River. This species can reach to 300 kg. Another species really interesting, but uh, not fit but mammal about Mekong River dolphin. Uh, this species also critically in danger. So let's talk about um, diversity of migration of the Mekong River. Um, here is the two species I look at the migration of the two species by autolic myrochemistry, uh, gray cat, gray eel catfish, and black hand paradise cat, paradise fish. So the otolic or ear bone uh, located inside of the feet, as you see in the pictures, and just next to the brain. And here is the pair of otolics. So I'm going to cut half of otolic to get a thin section like this. So this section, so the core, it is uh, where they were born. And this structure is similar to a ring tree, the core, the core and the uh, an annual rings. So for this session, I'm going to quantify some element by two techniques. So the first one is called LICBMS. So I'm going to analyze some J element from the core where they were born until the egg, until captures. So the second technique I use is SFM. So basically the whole surface of autolic is analyzed. So this, uh, this slide will help you to un the understand more about autolic microchemistry that I use to explore about feed migration. So one element called strontium. Uh, it is very rich in marine water, but very poor in fresh water. So Strontium in, in marine water is about a, a, more than 80 times higher compared to strontium in fat waters. So imagine that a fish were born in, in the sea in marine water and then they move up to river and then they move back to, to the sea. And the left hand side is the autolic. So let's see. Um, the autolic will observe elements from ambient water along their migration route. So let's see um, how elements trap in autolic. So this species were born in the sea and then move up to river. And then they're going to return to the sea. So this is the concept of uh, autolytic microchemistry. So basically, uh, this is the core, this is the where they were born. So it indicates that um, uh, they, the autolytic will capture some element from, from the place they were born. So the um, autolytic grow continuously and trap water chemistry along their migration routes and chemical composition of autolytic reflect the chemical composition of ambient water. So we can say that autolytic microchemistry can act, act as live flight re recorder. So there are much information about uh, microchemistry in autolytic so we can extract those information and will help us to understand uh, many ecological questions like fish migration. So this is the first species I'm looking at, the gray eel catfish. Here are some basic information about this species. This species is distributed in, in the West Pacific and also in the Mekong River. In the Mekong River, they distribute just a, a lower part of the Lower Mekong Basin. 
just below the waterfall from here to the sea. So I'm going to um, remove 38 in the video of this species and quantify some J element in autolix. And here is my finding. So first of all, you should look at the two things. The first thing is the I accept is the distance from the core. The distance is from the core, the, it is the time they were born until their capture. And the y axis is the ratio of chondrium to calcium. So you can see the two dotted line here. So the first line here it is about from zero to 3.2 with any K uh, in fresh water because it, uh, the concentration of uh, strontium is uh, very low. And from here to about 10, it's a get that the, this species stay in rocket water and about 10. So it, it uh, suggests that this species they live in marine waters. So for this species, I found uh, four migration patterns. Uh, the first pattern, uh, it account about 24% of total in the video. So for this species, they, the ratio of strontium to calcium is very low, it costs constantly. So it indicates that uh, these feet just remain in fresh water only. It uh, doesn't uh, connect to bracket or marine water at all. Uh, for, for the part and two, it's about 21%. Oh. So th those uh, individual, they, they stay mainly in marine water and a, a little bit connect to bracket water, but uh, uh, didn't connect uh, to fresh water at all. But uh, for pattern tree, it's really interesting. You can see it is the core. The concentration is very high. It means that uh, it's spawn in marine water and the larvae and juvenile uh, move directly to fresh water here and stay here for the while and then return to the sea. And for pattern four, it's similar to pattern three, but um, they move between marine and rocket water and don't connect to fresh water. So this is the result from uh, FFM. So bas basically on surface of autolic we will analyze. So let look, uh, let's look at the pattern one here. So the concentration of uh, strontium is uh, pretty low. It's uh, consistent with this one. It indicates that uh, it fit just remain in rocket uh, in uh, fresh water. Uh, let's look at the pattern tree. Uh, this one, you can see the core here. Concentration it really has indicated that um, this fish uh, were born in bracket or in marine water, and then they move to fresh water where the concentration it uh, drop down, and then they go back to marine water. So basically, uh, this species, I found four patterns. And this is the second species I look at. I also found four patterns, like most of uh, in, in the video of this species, about 48% of total individual, they just remain in fresh water only. They, they don't uh, connect to bracket or marine water at all. But other pattern, they move back and forth between fat and marine waters. So most um, most people think that uh, individual within species follow the single migration strategy. But my study show that um, at least two species show multiple migration strategies. 
And my findings suggest that we should consider the diversity of migration strategy at individual level for better income in management, conservation, mitigation, to maintain connectivity in, in the river, such as fish were designed. I just want to thank all people who helped me during my study. And tonight, you're going to watch a short video about Don Sa Hong Dam. It's just located on the main tip of the Mekong River, just located right here at the waterfall named Con Phong. It's about 700 kilometers from the sea. So here, this is some basic information about the dams. So this is the, the waterfall uh, named uh, Con Phong, located in the border between Laos and Cambodia, uh, located in the main tip of the Mekong River. So let's look at uh, this short video. <laughs> is one of the world's great rivers, running over 4,000 kilometers south from the Tibetan Plateau. On the southern tip of Laos, the Mekong crosses the Sipandon region, an island wetland complex of outstanding natural beauty. Preserving it was central to the Lao government's development challenge to grow the country's export revenue and become the battery of Southeast Asia, the Don Sahong hydropower project. It provides all the renewable energy the region needs, more than 2,000 gigawatt hours per year, plus a surplus for export to neighboring Cambodia. But crucially, the significant driver for Laos's socio-economic development comes with minimal environmental impact. 2006 saw the start of the nine-year project development period. The Mekong River is 10 kilometers wide, at Sipandon, with seven major channels running across a geological form, and fishing is the main source of income. The Don Sahong project picks up just one of the seven major channels and is the only hydropower scheme on the Mekong that isn't bank to bank, therefore not blocking the whole river. That makes the scheme unique in Asia and vital for the fishing communities. Many Mekong hydropower projects, particularly in China, have high dams and huge reservoirs to store water and generate electricity. But Don Sahong is a run of river scheme designed to work with existing river flows and the latest turbine technologies and has virtually no reservoir. So flood damage to Sipandon is minimized and far fewer people have to move their homes. Engineers found that this rocky river channel has just 5% of the Mekong River's total flow, with relatively consistent water levels. Construction took four years. Project managers were aware that this fragile living ecosystem must be treated with great care. Work began with the building of three coffer dams, upstream, secondary, and downstream, to close the river so that work could be done on dry land isolated from the river system. With the valley now dry, the upper section of Don Sapong's inlet was deepened to increase water flow. Then the embankments were fortified with rock taken directly from the channel excavation, eliminating the need for imported rock or sand. The same crushed rocks were used in the concrete to build a powerhouse. For other building materials, another precautionary and visionary step was taken. While many hydropower projects transport their materials in river barges, which could endanger aquatic animals such as dolphins, the Don Sahong project was different. The company built the Paping Bridge to allow project materials to be transported by land, along with a new 10 kilometer road at a cost of 8 million US dollars. The new bridge and roads are also used by locals, reducing boat traffic on the river and its impact on aquatic wildlife. This parallel project forms the cornerstone of the company's long-term commitment to the socio-economic development of the region. In the powerhouse, state-of-the-art bulk turbines made by General Electric are specially designed to be fish-friendly. They minimize impacts, pressure cavitation, and shear stress on any small fish passing through them. Larger fish are prevented from entering the turbines by screens. 
The completed embankment wall ranges from 0 to 25 meters high. 80% of the embankment is less than 10 meters high. When fully operational, the reservoir at high water level covers only about 220 hectares. The Datsun Hydro Power Project is a very important project for the Lao economy since on this project would uh, sell the output to the neighboring country and also bring more cash to the Lao government, to the economy, uh, through the royalty, to the uh, tax, and also speed up the development for the rural people. DSPC's commitment to the local population means that despite the project scale, only 14 families needed resettling less than two kilometers from their original homes with minimal disruption to their livelihoods. Working with village elders and the Resettlement and Livelihood Restoration Committee, GSPC has constructed irrigation channels along the Sahong and Saddam Island so that the locals could plant crops during the dry season. They launched a program for the raising of livestock, microfinancing for business development, and the retraining of some individuals to work on the project. Since our initial feasibility study in 2006, the company's long-term goal has been to create a technically viable project that provides infrastructure and economic opportunity, while understanding and mitigating the social and environmental impacts of the project. We believe the Don Sahong Hydropower Project will shine as an example of sustainable hydropower for years to come. Working with the government and people of Laos, we are invested in the future success of the nation. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Vu. So do we have um, questions and comments? I'm sure we do, particularly after that video. Um, please speak up or raise your hand. Hello, Dung Tong. Hi, 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 Anne, it's me again. Good evening. So, and, uh, a very, very interesting and exciting work from your migration uh, study. So I, I just wonder that from your results, the two species, they have different migratory strategy within the species. So we can say that they also have the different reproductive strategy as well in, in, in a species. Do, do you follow my question? They, they have the different migratory strategy, right? Yeah. Should we, should, should we say that they also have the different uh, reproductive patterns as well within a species? Yeah, actually, um, actually, when I look at why they are, have different migration strategy, and I found that uh, there are some factors they, they may contribute to, to, to the migration strategy. Like the first one is about feed body condition. And um, they tend to migrate between fat and marine quarter if they are healthy. I base it on uh, full top index. So it's likely that uh, some species, if they healthy and then they they're ready to migrate, but uh, other in individual they they don't. Uh, I mean, uh, it's not healthy and they 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 decided to stay. And uh, another thing is about migration distance. Some, some individual I caught in Cambodia, I mean, next to below the corn farm. And most of them, I mean, all of them, they, they just stay there and don't migrate to the delta at all. So, but some of, uh, so it means that it, uh, it uh, they, they tend not to migrate if the migration route is, is longer, I mean, they beyond their cap capacity. And uh, another thing is about body land. So feet tend to migrate when they were young. And when they get older, it tend to, to stay. It's not uh, migrate. That's what I found, yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank
Okay, th thank you. Where, 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 to, where, where to read your, your, your paper? Thanks. Yeah, I'm uh, waiting for some uh, comments from reviewers. <laughs> So th thanks a lot for that um, that question. Luis, I think we have a question from you and then Peng Bun. So we'll go Luis first and then Peng Bun second. Hi, Luis. Uh, hey, Anne, good to see you. And thanks for the presentation. It's always good to hear about the updates in your work. So that, that, was, that was great. I, I, I'm just wondering, I have a few, a few questions I will try to summarize in, in two mainly because uh, what, what you, you, you've showed seems like uh, a pattern for uh, big rivers at the end of the day, that you do have populations of fish with different migratory strategies and that would be similar to the Amazon. I'm wondering how, if, if you have compared in the literature, uh, you know, the strategies from other fish species at different places, tropical systems in the world, if they are relatively similar. And also my second question would be uh, related to whether you have uh, done analysis looking into the, uh, not influence, but the, the effects of the, the sampling location in the strategy of those different species that you've you've seen. So you've observed like four different patterns for for the catfish, for example. It, was that somehow related to some of the locations where you sampled the fish, or doesn't have any relationship with that? Yeah, just for the the last the last question about sampling location. So it it um. Same the question, it, uh, it have uh, like some of the uh, individual I caught far away from, from the sea, I mean, further upstream. And I found that they, I'm, at, at, at the beginning, we thought that they going to my radar team to the, to the, to the Mekong uh, actuary, but uh, none of them, they, they don't migrate to, uh, to the actuary just stay there. And some of the delta, I mean, just next to the echelon, I mean about maybe less than 100 kilometers away. So they, they tend to migrate to the echelon. So maybe they about food availability there and they try to migrate out to see if, uh, for feeding. But some, some individual upstream, I mean, they are, I mean, they are thinking that they are far away and then maybe costly to get there. So they, they just decide to stay. Um, your first question, I, I forgot. Yeah, no, the, the other one, uh, I was just, just wondering oh. if you, you have, you know, somehow compared and, and seen some uh, uh, similar strategies for other tropical systems in the world a big river such as the, the Amazon, uh, Paraguay and, and so on. So because it seems that, you know, at the end you're dealing or you're discussing uh, the existence of uh, metapopulations within the river and therefore we need to understand those metapopulations uh, to, to be able to manage for them uh, more appropriately. Yep, one species really, uh, I mean, very well known about Angola eel. So it, um, I, I saw that they, uh, the same species, but uh, it's similar to my species. They, some, some of the species, I mean, uh, um, you the uh, cataromus, they, they spawn in, in the sea, but migrate to the river, but um, they found that uh, not all of them, they migrate to the river. Some of them, they just stay in the sea and didn't, I mean, don't come back to river at all. So it's it, it quite a, similar to my species, the same species, but um, they have different migration pattern within the same species. Thank you, Anne. That was, that was great to, to, to see at the updates about your work. Congratulations. Yeah, that um, at the beginning, I am not, Despite what I found, but uh, I found something really interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, I do think as a comment, I do think, you know, that this type of, of information and results is critical for management, for appropriate management. Otherwise, you know, we may be managing uh, not in, a, in an appropriate way for all the different populations and different species we have in the river and dealing with the large diversity as you have in the Mekong, in the Amazon and so on is one key thing to do is to understand more about the, the ecology and the biology of these different species in, in my opinion. So thanks, thanks a lot. It was Absolutely, great. yeah. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Anne, and thanks, Luis, for the question. And we had another question from Peng Bun. Yeah, I think first I just have an overall comment that I think this is very interesting uh, studies. And in in the Mekong, actually, they mainly show pattern of fish migration up and downstream. But during my field observation, I think there are, there are also a specific pattern that, that nobody have, uh, have done uh, this study. For example, I think sp some species really, really utilize only the, the, the Le Sap Lake, the Great Lake, and the Mekong Delta. So the life cycle just only that uh, pass through. That's what I suspect, which, which could uh, generate a good idea for further studies. For example, the Crocker, I, I think uh, there might be a different population between the upstream close to Lao and the, the, maybe another population could be between the Lesap uh, Lake and the uh, Mekong Delta. And my, my question uh, probably very uh, similar to the second question by Luis, which uh, related to the uh, sampling site and sampling location. For example, how many uh, fish you have to cut and extract or to lead for the analysis for you to be able to generalize the, uh, the migration pattern or form migration pattern of the species. Thank you. Yeah, actually, um, uh, we can collect more. I mean, when we collect some more, we can have more information. But in my study for the first species about gray eel catfish, I collect about 38. And the second species about 29. So try to collect as many as possible. And uh, yeah, we can, yeah, basically we can find, if we can collect some more elements, we, we may identify more pattern, migration pattern, I think. And at, at the moment, we, the literature review said that about 24, about 24 or 25% of uh, Mekong, we know about their migration and loss of species. I mean, we have about more than 1000 species. So we don't know much about them. So basically we need to understand more about their migration, especially we can use photolytic microchemistry. We can understand more about their migration and then contribute to conservation and management. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, Peng Bun, for the question. I think we have time for one more question, if anybody has one. If so, please, please do so now. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Anne, for a really interesting and, and fascinating presentation. Um, it's it really interesting to see the work that you're doing um, with those species with really quite variable life histories. So that brings us to the end of our second webinar that was focusing on sustainable hydropower in Asia. I'd just like to say a few thank yous. A big thank you to Judy at the Institute of Hydro Ecology who organised this event and did a lot of the work um, planning it and getting the platform ready for us to give these presentations. I'd also like to thank Jenny Knight for organizing the event, the Eventbrite page and enabling people to, um, to sign up for it. A big thank you and congratulations to the four guest speakers for some fantastic presentations that were really interesting and informative and, and helped us develop this network and focus on the Asian context. 
and also a huge thanks to the people that participated and joined this present this um, webinar whether it was just to find out more to ask questions or to have particular uh, focused interests and, and comments on particular topics so thank you to everybody those of you that haven't signed up to become a participant please contact us and join the Shisan network and I very much look forward to seeing you all again at the next meeting which will be later on in the year in uh, in Africa and be focusing on hydropower development and the impacts it has and the potential for becoming more sustainable in the African context. So thank you once again and look forward to seeing you all soon. So, see you. Bye. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Bye,